thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. I um, hope everyone had a wonderful weekend and, and uh, happy Mother's Day to all our mothers. Um, we appreciate all that you guys do. Um, and so again, yeah, a little about me. I went, I think you already heard, I went to Penn State University. I uh, went to Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and did my residency there at the Rothman Institute and um, did a fellowship in hip and knee replacement outside of Washington, D.C. and at Alexandria, Virginia. I've been in practice here in Mercer County about eight years and been with the Rothman Institute for about the last four. Um, when we talk about pain uh, in hips and knees, uh, very commonly arthritis is causing pain for patients. So, you know, we hear this term arthritis. And so what is it? And so what it is, it's basically a loss of the cushion in your joints. Each of your bones has, uh, at the end of the bone, has a cartilage cushion. And when that cartilage cushion gets worn down, that's what arthritis is. It can be a wear and tear, like a degenerative condition. It can be a traumatic condition. Um, there's also a condition known as rheumatoid arthritis, which is part of an autoimmune family of diseases that attack the lining of the joints that cause joint degeneration. But that's one of the most common uh, causes of pain in the hips, knees, and even the, the shoulders as we get older. Um, so arthritis <laughs> developed from abnormal anatomy. Um, like let's say maybe you had a problem with your hip as a kid, maybe you could develop hip arthritis in your 50s or 60s, or if you had a fracture around your knee, your tibia or femur, um, that could cause abnormal anatomy, which could lead to arthritis. Um, abnormal biology, if there's a lack of blood flow to the joint, that can lead to degenerative changes or arthritic changes in the joint. Um, overuse, just, you know, that's kind of your wear and tear. You know, somebody who's worked, it's in a standing physical job for, you know, 40 years may develop arthritis. And then genetics. Uh, a lot of times we hear when people, when we tell people, hey, yeah, you have hip arthritis or a bad knee. Yeah, you know, my brother had a knee replacement or my mom had a knee replacement. And so that genetic component is certainly there. We're learning more about that as we learn more on genetics. So again, what causes arthritic pain? It's that in the healthy joint, the end of the bone is covered with that cartilage, which is a cushion. So the joint functions without pain. When that cartilage cushion deteriorates, that's when you get that bone on bone contact and that causes pain. So, you know, I liken it to a door hinge. So this is a brand new door hinge in a brand new building. And it's, it equates to healthy cartilage. It's well lubricated. It's got full motion and it's pain free. Now, normal function is something we all take for granted, right? Walking, getting in and out of a car, sleeping without pain. These are all like things that are a given, right? But over a course of uh, your lifetime, you know, your, your joint can end up looking like this. And this is an arthritic joint. It's a rusty door hinge. It doesn't have full motion. It's like losing cartilage. It's not lubricated. Um, and there's pain associated with it. So, you know, that's kind of my best analogy when trying to describe arthritis to patients. And so, you know, we can, we're going to talk a little bit about treatment options for arthritis. But before that, you know, I really like to focus on how are we going to be healthy? How are we going to prevent arthritis? How are we going to keep our bodies healthy, especially as we age? And then even after you do get a hip or a knee replacement, what can you do to stay healthy? And that's something that, you know, we, we don't have a great hold of a lot of times. But there, interestingly, there's a lot of good information out there about staying healthy. And, you know, this has been known for a long time. This is Plato, the Greek philosopher. And he even wrote that the lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being while movement and methodical physical exercise save it and preserve it. So basically with, with an exercise program, we can kind of keep our joints healthy. And, you know, if we do have arthritis, we can we can treat them. However, we'll, we'll talk about that a little later, but even after a hip or a knee replacement, or even when you're being treated non-surgically for arthritis, exercise and movement are an important point of keeping our joints healthy. So this is a 1953 Corvette. This is the first year uh, the Corvette was, uh, was out. And this, I need to update this because this is a 2015 Corvette and we have a new a C8 these days. So I got to get a C8 on this picture, but the 53 model versus the 2015 model, that's what we got. So what we want to do is we want to keep our 1953 model looking kind of like it does it did in 1953, or at least kind of functioning the same way, um, so that we can survive and thrive in 2015. So over a lifetime, you know, let's say sedentary lifestyle, bad nutrition, maybe even bad habits like say or, or, or tobacco, uh, basically we get rapid aging and the effects of chronic disease and even premature death. So. What you want to do is prevent your, your 53 Corvette from ending up like this. And that's the real key here, believe it or not, is exercise. 
So when we look at preventable risk factors for death, uh, we have tobacco, elevated blood sugar, elevated blood pressure, and then believe it or not, physical activity is number four. Um, obesity is number five. I think those two kind of go hand in hand. All five of these things increase the risk of heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Those are the things that are going to most commonly kill you. So, you know, how do we get older? Well, there's obviously the chronologic passage of time, and, and there's no way to slow that down. But there's also biologic aging. So why do some people say, wow, that 60-year-old looks like they could be 40, or wow, that 60-year-old looks like they could be 80? Um, you know, biologic, we have changes in the structure and function of our body. We have changes in individual cells, and then that leads to changes in vital organs. So, you know, the changes in the heart cells, for example, when you're 40, those changes are happening, and that can lead to, you know, the heart being abnormal when you're 60. Uh, uh, that goes with the liver and the kidney, and, and that's part of why, as we get older, we tolerate certain medications. Uh, or anesthesia, for example, uh, let, uh, more poorly because the organs, you know, the kidney and the liver aren't filtering out the toxins uh, as rapidly as they were when we were in our 20s or 30s. And so what happens when we age, basically we lose mechanical power. We decrease muscle mass. Uh, there's limited movement. You know, your knee doesn't bend the way it did when you were 20. So there's loss of range of motion. And our arthritis, we can get inflamed joints. Uh, what happens with metabolic? Um, uh metabolic i guess i just got a message um can you guys all hear me yeah all right so we're going okay here yes we can hear you. okay i got a message that's probably not related to this sorry about that um so when we age also we have metabolic changes right so our met metabolism just doesn't work as fast it's harder to lose 10 pounds when you're 60 than it is when you were 20 right so uh we get loss of efficiency as the body um uses oxygen for fuel, there's decreased cardiac output, which means there's actually decreased ability for physical activity, and our body doesn't respond to hormones the same way. What else happens when we get older? Uh, nerves, our nerves change. Our type two motor units, which are responsible for muscle strength and power decrease, and a sedentary lifestyle can actually lead to memory loss and decreased cognitive function. And then finally, hormones. <clears throat> we lose testosterone, we lose estrogen, and these, these are anabolic steroids, which help build our muscle and bones. So a sedentary lifestyle can also lead to decreased production of these steroids. So what prevents these changes? You knew it, it's gonna be exercise. And so what exercises should you do? Well, there is a, a large amount of literature on anti-aging and the, this kind of three-pronged approach to exercise is what we believe will help you uh, to kind of delay or, or prevent uh, you know, biologic aging. Uh, so there's aerobic conditioning, like cardiovascular exercise, there's strength training, and then there's balance and flexibility. And we're gonna go through each one and give you guys some tips on what types of things you can do. So aerobic conditioning, this is the classic stuff. Uh, we see treadmills, step aerobics, and so the benefits are that you're going to improve your heart and lung health. You're going to improve uh, your blood vessel compliance. Um, it's going to decrease your blood pressure if you exercise, decrease the plaques in your blood vessels. You're going to decrease fat and maintain muscle. So, you know, what should you do? The American Heart Association actually recommends 30 to 45 minutes, three to five times per week. Um, there's also, you know, what do you do? Do you do high or moderate intensity, like running, biking, or swimming? Do you do low intensity, like walking or swimming? You know, my tip for everyone is if you're going to do exercise, you have to do something that you actually sort of enjoy. Because if you hate biking and you get a spin bike and you use it really, really hardcore for a month or two, eventually you'll quit because you don't like it. So you have to find an activity you enjoy, you know, whether it's just walking with a friend on, on you know, the towpath by the river or whether it's going to a gym and getting on an exercise bike or even doing like a Zumba class. It's just got to be something you enjoy. So the next part is strength training. And we're not talking, you know, like these, you know, huge guys. We're not trying to bulk up like this, but we're, we're trying to use, you know, smaller weights and our body weight to really get stronger. Strength training has numerous benefits. Increased muscle mass, you're going to increase your lean muscle, and that's going to actually, believe it or not, improve your bone density. So for uh, most commonly, women are more concerned about this, but for osteoporosis, strength training is actually a great way to improve or prevent osteoporosis. Strength training is also going to decrease your fat mass, and it's actually, believe it or not, proven to help you live longer. Um, so the bottom line, though, with strength training is more muscle equals more calories burned. And so what can you do? Um, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends 8 to 10 exercises of 8 to 12 reps two days a week or more. 
So, you know, if you're getting to the gym and maybe you do like a circuit training type thing, that's great. Um, regular classic weightlifting is good. Um, again, more high rep, uh, low weight type system, uh, system, um, body weight. So you can do planks, pushups, lunges. Um, there's all kinds of things you can buy at the sporting goods store, a BOSU ball, a medicine ball, resistance bands. All these things can be part of a strength training program, which can benefit your body significantly and really help your joints. Um, balance and flexibility is the last part of this program. And this is really key. Um, it helps to maintain your range of motion and improve your, your tendon so you get less strains uh, or less injuries when you do activity. Helps to improve posture and um, releases endorphins, which are actually natural pain suppressants. Um, and really, in, as we get older, it can, improving your balance and flexibility can actually help prevent falls, which is one way you know, a lot of our uh, people you know, over 60, 70, 80 years old will get wrists or hip or shoulder fractures. So, you know, you can do a lot of different things here. You can do sustained stretches like you learned in gym class as a kid, just sitting and reaching. You can do dynamic stretches like jumping jacks. Um, you can do, all, you can use uh, different machines or devices to help you stretch. And then classes like yoga or Pilates can also help significantly. So an anti-aging exercise program will increase mechanical stress, which is going to increase your strength and power and also met metabolic stress. And those two things in combination are gonna stimulate your endocrine system to produce anabolic hormones like testosterone, growth hormone, and insulin-like growth factor. And these are naturally produced by the body and they support and promote muscle and protein synthesis. So this isn't like you know the baseball steroids people are taking. When it's naturally done, it's very safe and it stimulates your cells to produce uh, new muscle and new protein cells. And so, you know, can this work? And, and, and it absolutely can. Believe it or not, the fastest growing age of triathlon um, participants are in their th late 30s and early 40s. Um, more than 50% of Ironman finishers are over the age of 40. And Ironman records are actually still being set by people over the age of 65. So, you know, maybe not everyone's an elite athlete as they age, but there, certainly this type of program can be done by everybody. And, you know, we, you, we all have limitations. If you have a bad knee, you may have to modify this uh, program, but uh, there is certainly something that everybody can do. Uh, the New York Marathon is, a, is another one with a lot of data. Uh, they've been running this for years, and 25% um, of marathons in their 60s outperformed half of the runners from 20 to 54. And new t record times are being set by men and women uh, who are older uh, every year. So that's kind of your, your exercise program to kind of keep your joints healthy. Now, what happens when they're not healthy? Here's an example of an arthritic hip. And so the hip works. It's a ball and socket joint with the femur here and the ball on top. And that ball is covered with cartilage. And then here's the socket, which is also covered with cartilage. And so when we talk to patients about their hip pain, uh, we ask if they limp. We ask if they have difficulty performing like daily tasks, like tying shoes or housework, putting on socks. Um, sometimes they'll have balance problems. You know, where do they have pain? Does it go to the thigh, the groin, the buttock, or even radiate down to the knee? These are all questions we ask. And so, you know, when you have hip arthritis, how can it be treated? Well, heat, ice can help. Um, exercise and physical therapy, we've already spoken of. It's good for weight loss and good for motion and function. Um, medications like Motrin or Tylenol can help. And then even steroid injections can help. But when these things fail, a hip replacement is a great option. Uh, we do this a lot at Capital Health. Um, it's a great procedure that can help relieve pain and improve mobility. Uh, very common, probably this number is pretty old. This is from 2009. I bet you about 500,000 are being done every year in our country, and it's projected to even be more than that by, the, by 2030. So <clears throat> a hip replacement is a procedure that removes that disease joint with implants, and so or replaces it with implants. So what we do is we basically cut the bone right about here, and we take this bone and we throw it away. And then we put a metal shell inside the pelvis here. We put a plastic liner inside of that. We put a metal stem inside the femur here, and then a ball on top of that to articulate with the liner and shell. And then we're kind of recreating your anatomy, and that's your hip replacement. So here's an x-ray of an arthritic hip right here. Um, it's bone on bone right here. There's whitening of the bone or sclerosis, and there's even cysts in the bone. And then here's an x-ray of a hip replacement. So here's the metal shell in the pelvis. Here's the metal stem in the femur. And then here's the ball on top of that. And then there's a piece of plastic between the ball and the shell there. Hip, uh, so the anterior approach is something that we do a lot of at Capital Health. It's an uh, approach where we make the incision on the front of the leg rather than the side or back. 
Uh, a surgeon can work between muscles and tissues without detaching them from the hip or thigh bone. And the way I do it is I actually use this torture device, also known as a fracture table. Well, you know, the patient's legs are locked into here. And then <clears throat> I can use an x-ray machine intraoperatively to help leg length and component placement during the surgery. So this is the way I like to do hip replacement and it works very well. It's pretty common actually. Uh, it's been done in the United States for about the last 20 years, but actually dates back to the 50s or 40s in France. Um, <clears throat> hip replacement overall is a fantastic procedure. Um, about uh, you know, 97, 98% uh, successful and, and patients really do well. I was gonna move on to the knee now. Um, so knee arthritis, again, here's your knee. You know, you have your shin bone or your tibia, your thigh bone or your femur, and your kneecap or your patella, and then you have the cartilage in between all these bones. And the knee is actually the largest joint in the body. And sometimes we call it a hinge joint, but it actually moves a little more, uh, a little more, it's a, the movement's a little more complicated than that. Um, and so again, arthritis is one of the most common causes of knee pain, especially as we get older, older than the age of 50, 60 years old. Again, that what's causing the pain, it's that wear and tear of the cartilage leads to bone on bone contact. So when we talk to our knee replacement patients or knee arthritis patients, we ask them, does it hurt more than a day a week? Does it interfere with sleep? Is it tough to walk more than a block? Has inactivity from knee pain caused you to gain weight? These are all things we hear from our patients. So kind of treatment options are similar. We have water like heat and ice, uh, aqua therapy. We have exercise and physical therapy, which again is part of our you know, three-pronged exercise program to keep our joints healthy. Uh, medications like anti-inflammatories or steroid injections. And then there's another type of medication called visco supplementation. You've probably heard of this. This is like the chicken stuff or the rooster comb or the gel. Um, there's a bunch of names for it, synvisc, orthovisc, monovisc, uh, gel one. Um, they all work. And they can help to decrease inflammation and, and kind of lubricate the joint. I liken the gel injections to WD-40 for the hip. Uh, when these non-operative treatments fail, a knee replacement is a great option and it just replaces the damaged surfaces of bone and helps relieve pain and restore mobility. Again, I think this number is low. Uh, we're probably close to about a million knee replacements a year in our country and by 2030 that number will be significantly higher. So in a knee replacement what we do is we just remove a thin portion of diseased bone and cartilage. Um, so like here's the femur or the femoral component would sit on the femur like so. The tibia or tibial component would sit on the tibia like so. And then there's a piece of plastic in between. And that allows the, uh, the metal to rub on plastic instead of bone to rub on bone. Um, and so here's a healthy knee. So here's the femur, here's the tibia. The black space between represents cartilage. The kneecap's back here and kind of behind, so it's in the shadow here. Um, and then here's a replaced knee. So this is the metal component on the femur, metal component on the tibia, and the black here represents the plastic in between. So in summary, the leading cause of knee pain is arthritis, and it's a degenerative condition that won't get better over time and might get worse. And early diagnosis and treatment for knee replacement are important. And knee replacement, again, is a great surgery um, that you know m thousands or really millions of people are, are do this procedure every year and uh, are typically very glad they did it. So, you know, what can you expect after a joint replacement from a standpoint of, you know, going from the hospital stay, you know, to kind of your life after the surgery. So the hospital is usually like a one night stay. A lot of people will go home the same day. We have to do the surgery in the morning and we have you walking the day of surgery. For a knee replacement, you'll typically need to start physical therapy as an outpatient. Um, and, and for hip replacement, mostly we just tell you to walk. Um, big part of your recovery is pain and nausea control. If we can control your pain and nausea, then you can do your therapy. And, and so that's one of the real, the goals that we try for uh, in the hospital and even when you're home. Uh, as far as returning to work or activity, uh, everybody's a little different as far as, you know, when they can get back to certain things. But the goal is to get you to be able to do the things that you want to do after the surgery. The best predictor of what you're going to be able to do after the surgery is what you were doing in the year before. So if you tell me that, um, you want to uh, uh, go skiing, you know, uh, after your knee replacement and you haven't skied in 25 years, well, that's probably not realistic. But if skiing is something you were doing last year and it's something you want to try, then it's totally reasonable to get back to after your surgery. And then again, after your surgery, it's important to kind of maintain your health or even continue to improve it. So having an exercise program, kind of like we've, what we've already talked about, is important, you know, once you've kind of recovered from surgery. 
And so the best way to prevent a joint replacement is to stay active and to control your weight. Um, and, but you know, even after surgery, we want you to stay active and control your weight. Uh, so that was kind of what I had for you as far as healthy joints and keeping your joints healthy and, and kind of uh, interlacing that into arthritis and treatment for arthritis. I'm happy to take some questions uh, if people have questions. You can probably do the easiest way is usually to type them into the chat box and I can kind of go through them that way. Thank you. So uh, yes, if anybody has questions, um, you can either ask them, write them in the chat box. And also um, before you leave, please do the evaluation. That'll be in the chat box. Dr. Saxena, there's a couple questions in the chat box. Do you want to read them or do you want me to read them for you? I can go through them, no problem. Okay, all right. One second. Um, so, questions. So let's see, uh, what's going on? Not much. Um, can we describe what to expect when recovering from a knee replacement? Um, yeah, so knee replacement is a great procedure, uh, but it can be tough to recover. So uh, there's certainly pain associated with that. Most people will tell you the pain is tolerable, but it's certainly there. Um, people can get a lot of swelling, a lot of soreness in the knee. So icing, elevating the knee are really important. I always stress to my patients that, look, this isn't just like a, you know, sometimes people are leaving the same day or just leaving the next morning from the hospital. Despite that, this isn't just like a quick, hey, I got my knee replacement and I'm good to go takes a lot of work, takes a lot of effort. So you really have to give it time. Um, you have to give the, the knee time to relax uh, and, and then you have to work on the therapy. So it's a process. I would say usually by about eight weeks, most people are done with their formal physical therapy and can just do an exercise program. Um, and, and usually um, from, by about the four month mark, people are feeling really good and, and really ready to get back to normal stuff. But it does take a full year to recover from that surgery. Uh, why after knee replacement am I getting pain to the inside of my knee? There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, sometimes it just, there, there's nothing, there's no smoking gun or anything. It's just is what it is. Uh, sometimes it may just take time for it to get better. Um, so that's a tough one to kind of answer specifically uh, for you. Um, can exercise aggravate bone on bone or knee arthritis? Absolutely, exercise can aggravate your arthritis. And so that's why it's important to have an exercise program. And if the exercise program is, is aggravating you, to modify it. Most commonly, people with knee arthritis uh, will prefer a recumbent exercise bike. That tends to allow them to exercise and get their heart rate up without putting, a, uh, or with putting the least amount of load on the knee joint. So that's a good option for my arthritic knee patients. Uh, shin splints are, you know, a chronic condition uh, that basically is soreness in the shins with any activity. A lot of times shin splints can get better by improving your shoe wear um, or taking anti-inflammatories. Uh, sometimes they're tough to get better though, so it takes time and it can be a very frustrating condition to have. The only caveat with shin splints is you don't want to assume it's shin splints and instead have it be a stress fracture because that could be a bigger problem. So it is important if it's something that's lasting for a really long time. Um, there are more than kind of a short period of time, probably to have it checked. So how long is a knee replacement good for? Uh, knee replacements, uh, we have good data that shows they're, they're lasting 20 years, 80 to 90% of the time. That doesn't mean they're failing year 20, day one, but we think they're going to last even longer than that. So, you know, it'd be reasonable to expect that if you had a knee replacement today, that it would still be functioning well in 20 years. I am ready to be scheduled. Just call the office. Uh, the number's here. Uh, we are happy to schedule you for surgery. Um, so how long is the recovery time after hip replacement? You know, the hips are a little easier to recover from than knees. Again, you're going to walk the day of surgery, be in the hospital one day, maybe one night, maybe discharge the same day. And usually by about the four week mark, most people walk into the office with a cane or nothing at all. And then again, you have to, it's a gradual process. And I would say most of the recovery is made by about the two to three month mark. And again, it takes a full year to get the maximum benefit from the surgery. That's I'm concerned. Uh, someone's concerned about getting to the bathroom during the night as they have to pass through a sunken living room. 
Yeah, that's a good point. You know, if you're having a surgery like this, it's important to set your house up so that, you know, uh, it's safe. And so um, at either maybe sleeping in a different place, uh, like in a different room than you're used to, um, or setting yourself up somewhere else is certainly a consideration if you're undergoing a surgery, especially on your lower extremities. And, and you're concerned about, you know, getting to the bathroom and um, just getting around the house. So, you know, planning ahead is really important and, and setting your house up to succeed for yourself is important. Um, if one has osteoarthritis in the hip, does delaying the hip replacement surgery cause additional damage or can one wait until pain interferes with life? Typically, the answer is you can wait until pain interferes with life. There are some cases where, and I actually had one this morning in the office where I said to a patient, look, usually I'd say you can wait, but this one, you know, you're actually causing damage to the bone here, which may be harder to fix. So it, it's important to get that analysis from, from your doctor and, and have an x-ray and, and sort of monitor it. Um, but most of the time, yeah, delaying isn't going to cause more damage. Um, mentioned that there is 97% success rate with hip replacement. What are the complications and what do you typically see? Fortunately, complications are rare. Uh, they're broken down in the way I look at them into two, uh, two types of complications, surgical and non-surgical. So non-surgical complication might be, you know, a blood clot or a stroke or a heart attack. These things happen rarely, but they can happen. We actually have you talk to your doctor before surgery and actually have you do pre-admission testing just to make sure there's nothing that we can correct or optimize before the surgery to hopefully prevent any of those type of complications. Surgical complications are, are ones that require another surgery. So, you know, infection, fracture around the prosthesis, dislocation of the prosthesis. These things happen rarely, but they happen and they can be treated appropriately when they happen so you can kind of move on from it. Uh, please get yeah, everyone please complete the survey at the end of the lecture that really helps us to educate the community and figure out what else the community yeah. can hear. Um, I hear some people have excellent results with knee replacement and the same person may not have a good result with the second one. The second one never feels right. Hip replacement seems to have a fantastic success rate. I would say really with any surgery just because you had a great result on the right side doesn't mean the left is going to be exactly the same. So um, that is a little bit of a challenge what I have to explain to patients. But again, for the most part, people do well with both surgeries. The hip replacements do get a little more satisfaction than the knees typically. The hip's an easier surgery to recover from. Um, but, you know, they can both do well. And I think it's important to discuss these things with your doctor if you're, you're suffering from these ailments. Dr. Sexine, I think we may have somebody, they raised their hand, they want to ask a question. So if somebody did, is it okay for them to ask their question? Sure. Oh, Somebody have a question? No. Guess not. Okay. All right. Then we we'll can keep going with the, with the chat box chat here. Box. These are all good questions. Um, what are your thoughts on continuing to jog with knee arthritis and also swim and bike? Um, yeah, absolutely. I recommend you be active. I, I do tell my arthritic knee patients that, you know, running on a treadmill or a hard surface can aggravate your pain, but as long as you're tolerating it, it's a great thing to do. Swimming and biking are great for our arthritic patients, so I would encourage any activity that you want to do to go ahead and do it. Um, kind of off that same vein, is a treadmill okay for bone-on-bone -bone knee problems? Yeah, I mean, a treadmill's fine. I don't have a restriction. I would tell you that if you have bone-on-bone -bone knee arthritis, you're probably going to hurt more when you do a treadmill than you would an exercise bike. But again, if you enjoy it and you can tolerate it, go for it. People are talking about taking cartilage orally for joint pain. Are there any studies to show success or disprove this? Um, no studies that show success. Uh, the problem with taking cartilage orally for joint pain is your stomach's going to absorb it and kind of dissolve it. And then it's got to get into your bloodstream and get to your joint and then be, you know, constituted in the structure of the cartilage. And because cartilage loses its blood supply as we age, it's really unrealistic for any of that to happen. So no studies have shown that to work. Um, some of these cartilage supplements uh, are shown to have some anti-inflammatory effects that can help. But as of right now, there is no way to regrow cartilage. Someone has patellar chondrosis and exercises often. They feel a little discomfort almost daily, but don't know what to do. Um, yeah, I mean, basically exercising is good. Using Voltaren and turmeric are good. Um, uh, really just keep doing, you know, all the options. At some point, a steroid injection might help or gel injections might help. Um, can you overstress it? Absolutely. If that happens, you'll need to listen to your body and sort of back off on activity. Um, but, you know, the big key is to kind of keep exercising. 
and stay thin. Uh, what does it mean when pain from your hip starts reading to your knee? Um, that's a common thing we see with hip arthritis is that patients will actually complain of knee pain or have pain radiating from the hip joint to the knee. Um, it basically means you need to start actively treating your hip arthritis and, and whatever that may be, anti-inflammatories, steroid injections, exercise, or even hip replacement. Do hip flexor exercises soothe knee pain? I don't know that they soothe knee pain, but certainly hip flexor exercises are a great way to stretch and uh, should be part of a stretching program. Um, when I walk for more than 15 minutes, I have a bulge on the outer part of my knee, which goes away when I stop after about 20 minutes. Um, not sure what that could be. Um, that could be um, uh, that could be some fluid or swelling in the joint. Um, it could be a tendon issues. So that's something that would probably need a little more of a detailed exam. Uh, the oral stuff is that osteobiflex? Yes, it is. Um, osteobiflex. Mm -hmm. Yes. Glucosamine, glu glucosamine, chondroitin. All these things are kind of oral supplements that can help with arthritic pain. Yeah, they I think will the not size of your other watch is good. Yeah, it's 29, so I will get 33, I think. At like the most, yeah. Someone's yeah. having a conversation that, on there. Too big. Yeah, could you please mute your microphones? Well, it looks like we got through all the questions on the chat box. Does anybody have that? These are all great questions. Um, anybody else with any other I guess, is the meeting recorded, or can they get the recording in an email? Um. Yes, we are recording it. If you're interested, um, you would contact Marsha um, at Capital Health. And um, as far as copy of your presentation, I guess if Mar if you give Mar Marsha permission, she can send it out. Okay. And I can give you, I can, uh, I'll type in Marsha's uh, email address. Sure, someone asked about the question about osteobiflex. Um, yeah, that's one of the many oral supplements you can take. Um, it doesn't regrow cartilage, but it can help with joint pain, probably an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, so you could certainly try it if um, you're having those symptoms. Uh, no, so your cysts uh, are, you know, are cysts in the back of your knee or fluid collections in the back of the knee. They are usually caused either by arthritis or a meniscus tear. They're caused by something happening in the joint itself. So when people say, oh, can you just get rid of the cyst? The problem is you can, but it'll probably come right back if you don't treat the problem in the joint. Um, but they're a pretty common thing that we see. Can you get away from having the replacement surgery? You absolutely never have to have a hip or knee replacement. Unfortunately, we do know that arthritis is a degenerative condition that gets worse over time and not better. So it's very likely that over time, your arthritis will get worse. So um, if it decreases your function and, and causes more pain, at some point you may want to have the joint replacement, um, but you never have to do it. I just put Marsha's email address up there in the chat box. Uh, typically, when, when can one begin lower body stretching and lower body weight training after a hip replacement? Stretching, you can pretty much begin right away um, as long as you're safe with it. Um, Muscle training, I would wait about two months because you want your bone to grow into that implant. Uh, do you use the knee muscle sparing approach? Yeah, we don't cut any uh, muscles uh, when we do. I, I do knee replacement. Most people pretty much do it that way. So, and the muscle sparing thing is kind of more of a marketing thing than anything else. Uh, is robotic surgery different from the surgery you have described? No, robotic surgery is the same. Um, you can use a, ro a robotic assistance to do a hip or a knee replacement, um, and, and they can work well. Uh, they haven't shown robotic surgery to be better than kind of traditional surgery, but it certainly is a nice tool. I have a question. Sure. Um, I was in your office last year and po have postponed my hip surgery. And uh, I'm the person who's now, when I do a lot of work in the yard, the pain now radiates down to my knee, but I'm trying to postpone my hip surgery until like November-ish when I don't have to work in my yard anymore. Would a steroid injection help me fend mm. off having hip replacement. I, I had my other hip done in 2018. And frankly, I just don't want to go through it again. So that's why I keep postponing, <laughs> I yeah. keep postponing it. 
A steroid injection could absolutely help, you know, depending on how bad the disease you have. Um, a lot of times we do steroid injections and they only provide a week or two worth of relief. So they, they can be ineffective, but if you have some mild to moderate arthritis, a steroid injection could help. So you might want to just come back to the office. We can get a new x-ray and, um, see if you, you know, it's something that would work. It's certainly something you could try, um, and just kind of see how you respond. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll make an appointment. I, I have found that if I do like cut the yard and work in the garden, I need to take like a day or two after that to recover. My hip will stop hurting. And then I, of course, go out and do the same thing again. So I just keep aggravating it. But um, maybe I'll just make an appointment to come back and see you again. <laughs> I attended both of these lectures and they've been very helpful. So thank you. You're welcome. We'll see, see you soon. I have a question. Um, my question has to do with turmeric versus glucosamine chondritin. Is one thought of better for uh, inflammation in the knee, uh, or is it best to take both of them, or advisable to take neither? You know, it's trial and error. Turmeric's been around. It, it's um, kind of an Eastern medicine thing. It's a uh, a spice, I guess, which has an anti-inflammatory effect and can help with joint pain. Um, glucosamine is kind of that, that cartilage type supplement. Uh, basically, they both work uh, reasonably well as far as anti-inflammatory function and properties and can help you. So what I usually recommend to people, look, try it, see if it works for you. Um, so I would try one, maybe try one for a week, see how you feel. Try the other one for a week, see how you feel. And then maybe try taking them both at the same time and see how you feel. I'm not aware of any major um, like drug interactions or um, you know adverse effects with either of those two supplements. So I, I think they're pretty safe. Um, it's just a question of if they work for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, everybody. Well, it was a pleasure being here today. Um, sorry, it was virtual. Maybe maybe the next time we do something like this, we can um, uh, we can do it in person. Um, but I hope everyone found the information valuable. Um, the Rothman, I work at the Rothman Institute and, and we work with Capital Health very closely to care for uh, the, the community's orthopedic needs. So anything you can, we can do for you, let us know. Thanks so much.